Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fourth lecture. Uh, we have been discussing a number of very interesting things in the area of philosophy of science. And uh, if you recall, last time we did discuss uh, what we call the construction of the world, uh, but more specifically looking at uh, the Laplacian scrutability thesis. Uh, today, uh, we continue with a discussion in the philosophy of science, uh, but more specifically dealing with the scrutability and the logical structure of the world. Uh, and of course, again, we pick uh, from the ideas of Canap, and uh, of course, you do appreciate um, uh, that he is one of those philosophers that uh, did attempt to uh, describe and construct uh, the world. So today, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, structure of the presentation uh, will be as follows. Uh, we shall discuss uh, primitive concepts. Uh, from there, we shall look at the objections to the logical structure of the world. And then from there, we shall move from more definitional to a, pro a, a, a priori uh, scrutability. And then we shall continue uh, discussing uh, issues uh, which range from descriptions uh, to intentions. And then uh, from there, I will establish what we call the scrutability base, and thereafter, uh, deal with the reviving of the logical structure of the world. Now, in the unlikely event that I do not cover everything, ladies and gentlemen, then I'll ask you to uh, continue uh, reading the books that I gave you. Uh, you'll be able to discover uh, many other new things uh, from there. Uh, at your level, uh, you are expected to do a lot of reading and to pick ideas uh, from them. So I can say at this material time, ladies and gentlemen, that the logical structure of the world suggests that epistemology, uh, which is based on um, modern symbolic logic, is concerned with the logical analysis of scientific propositions. We know that very well. And we did cover uh, propositions under uh, Laplace's uh, scrutability theory, if you remember, when we are dealing with Laplace's demons. So we are dealing with the propositions. So when we deal with epistemology, uh, we'll look at uh, a board of knowledge uh, which is based on modern symbolic logic, uh, dealing with the logical analysis uh, of scientific propositions. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, this science that we are talking about uh, is itself based uh, on experience and is the source of knowledge to the external world and that is the world outside the rim of uh, human perception. So why don't we begin with the primitive concepts as we had said earlier on. So what are the basic elements of thought? I'm sure now you can answer that question because we went through them and those are concepts anyway. Right, so the basic elements of thought are constituted by concepts. So we start with the concepts. We start with the conceptual systems, right. So it is, for example, common to hold that, uh, well, you can hold a number of thoughts, right, and very, very common to hold that thoughts such as uh, beetroot, for instance, you can say beetroot are pink, right. You can also say that um, uh, your shirt is red, your shirt is green, your cup is yellow, that kind of thing, right? Now, as you can see, that thought that I've just given you, that beetroot are pink, are composed of concepts, such as beetroot, beetroot is a concept, and pink is a concept. Now, it is also common to hold that many concepts are composed from simpler concepts, right? So many concepts are composed from simpler concepts. So that's why you start. And uh, for example, Aristotle held that man 
can be defined as rational and moral. That was Aristotle. Now, this definition from Aristotle suggests that the concept man is a complex concept built out of the simpler concepts, rational and animal. That's why Aristotle held that man can be defined as rational animal. Rational is a concept, right? And you can actually call it a simple concept, and the animal is a simple concept. So you can define man, which is also a concept, using those simpler concepts. So these are what we call the basic elements of thought, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why in his manuscript, the alphabeto cogitationum humanorum, right? Lebanese who lived around uh, 1679 to 1681, suggests that there is a level of concepts so simple that they make an alphabet from which all thoughts can be composed. And that was Lebanese. And you know, you all know Lebanesian theorem. Uh, for some of you have done statistics, right, and mathematics. Lebanese actually comes from there. So according to Lebanese 1679 and 1681, the alphabet of human thoughts is a catalog of primitive concepts. That is, of those things that we cannot reduce to any clearer definitions. So that's why in an essay concerning human understanding, John Locke, one of the philosophers of the time who lived around 1690, develops such a picture he introduces what we call complex ideas or complex concepts as follows. And he says that as simple ideas are observed to exist in several combinations united together, so the mind has a power to consider several of them united together as one idea. And that's what he says. And that not only as they are united in external objects, but as itself has joined them together. So ideas thus make up several simple ones put together. I call this complex. And of course, from the works of Locke 1690, in his book 2, chapter 12, he goes ahead and he talks about those concepts which he calls simple such as beauty, gratitude, a man, an army, the universe, etc. Now, those can be simple, but they can also be complex. So remember, you start with the concepts, right? And then you move on to higher levels. And therefore, we use concepts to describe things. For example, a whole story about something can be represented by a word and in that case, that would be a concept that describes what is happening. And that's why we start with the modeling. And then we end up with the conceptual diagrams and conceptual models, ladies and gentlemen. So again, as you can see, Locke 1690 held that all of our perceptions and thoughts derive from simple ideas. Locke also believes, right, in his works, uh, book two, chapter 21, that uh, most basic ideas, right, uh, come down to maybe eight uh, classifications here, right? So Locke, 1690, suggests that the most basic ideas come down to eight. So he came up with eight uh, ideas. But somehow he tells us that three ideas uh, of matter that come to us through our senses include, for instance, extension, right? Solidity, mobility, and mobility simply means the power of being moved. So those are three, right? Uh, of course, those ones come through our senses. Extension, solidity, and mobility. Then two ideas, right? So two ideas are ideas of mind. 
that come to us through reflection, right? When you start reflecting on certain things, and therefore these constitute things like uh, perceptivity, the power of perception, the power of thinking, and this is perceptivity. Then you have motivity, the power of moving, right? And of course, those are two, and that the two, and the earlier three, right, which are the, 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 the ideas of matter uh, that come to us through our senses, extension, solidity, those are five now. And then, of course, the last three are neutral ideas uh, that come to us both ways. And these include things like existence, duration, and number, ladies and gentlemen. So the same theme can be found in some parts of contemporary uh, cognitive science. And uh, of course, uh, we've got, um, uh, for instance, semantic primes, right? And that come in the area of language. And uh, these are really uh, impressions in every uh, human language, uh, which are analyzed in terms of uh, semantic primes that occur in every language. So these are very important. And they, are e they, they, they can actually be extended uh, to the field of uh, cognitive science. Uh, hopefully, when we get time, we shall go through uh, the cognitive uh, perspectives and philosophies, and we shall be able to understand this very well. Now, I want to draw your attention to a book uh, that was written in 1972. And uh, that book is about semantic uh, primitives. And uh, the work was published by um, uh, Wiesbeker. Now, Wiesbeker uh, proposed 14 uh, semantic primes, right? And uh, you'll find those works there. And uh, uh, those works are supplemented by uh, the book uh, that was Bika wrote in 2009, which he calls uh, Book of Experience, Evidence, and Sense, uh, which expanded these primes to 63, right? But let me just give you an example so that you understand the concepts and how these led. Uh, for example, substantives, right, is a prime. And under substantives, you have I, you, someone, something, thing, etc., and these are concepts. Then from there, you go to what we call relation substantives. And they include things like kind, they include things like part, and so forth, right? And uh, these are very, very, very important as well. So we also move to another level, uh, ladies and gentlemen, where we have the determiners. And determiners, you have concepts like this, the same, after etc then we have the quantifiers uh, these include things like one two some all much etc and these are primes you have evaluators where you have for example good bad you have the descriptors uh, big small you've got the mental uh, predicates like think no want feed then you have speech uh, you have words like say uh, uh, words and uh, of course true, right? I hope you are following. And these are primes. And then you have actions and events like do, happen, move, touch. Then you have um, uh, existence or possessions, and you have primes like to be somewhere or there is, right? Then you have uh, life and death primes, uh, which have live or die time, then you start talking about when, uh, before, after, then you have space, where, uh, it is still logic, uh, you say not, or maybe, uh, because, then you have the argumenters, where you have uh, very, or more similarity, it is, it is, ladies and gentlemen. Now, all those are primes, ladies and gentlemen, and primes are very, very, very important in the things that we are now discussing. And uh, do not forget, ladies and gentlemen, to go and read the works of Anna Wiesbeker, 1972, right? And I gave you the book, right? And that book is called Semantic Primitives. 
I've also asked you to go and read Anna uh, with Bika's work 2009, which is the book of experience, evidence, and sense, where with Bika expanded the list from eight primes to a list of 63 primes. I cannot go through them, but I've just given an example of determiners, quantifiers, evaluators, time, space, logic, etc. And that's very important. Now, I want to say that Anna was become uh, uh, his wa uh, her works, right? Anna was because 1972 methods uh, have been used to analyze an extraordinary range of expressions in many different languages. And of course, since we are dealing with the conceptualization, these things relate to what we are doing, the philosophy of science. And of course, to give the flavor of the project, a sample analysis from Goddard 2003, page 408, runs as follows, right? And again, we are using primes and trying to extend the ideas and coming up with a range of expressions, right? For example, if you say, X lied to Y, right? Now, this means that X said something to person Y. It also means that X knew it was not true. And X said it because X wanted Y to think it was true. So people think it is bad if someone does this. So those are now the interpretations of certain things that come to our mind. Now, in the 20th century philosophy, this sort of framework that I've just presented to you was developed most systematically by Bertrand Russell and Rudolf Carnap. And of course, uh, uh, Russell engaged in numerous different projects of analysis and construction and uh, uh, some central works concerning analysis into principles uh, involves uh, acquainting uh, and uh, uh, acquaintances and getting knowledge, uh, which include knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. And of course, also the problems of philosophy and the theory of knowledge. Now, of course, he pursued uh, related projects of constructing the world uh, from primitives, and therefore we are also looking at the logical construction of the world. So that's why I gave that very example. Yeah, when you say, right, that X lied to Y, right, get that logical construction. When you say X lied to Y, it means that X said something to person Y. It also means that X knew it was not true. X said it because X wanted Y to think it was true. And people think it is bad if someone does that. And that is the logical construction. So logical construction of the world then becomes an important aspect uh, of our philosophy of science. So that's why Russell suggests and suggested that all concepts are composed from concepts of objects and properties with which we are directly acquainted. Now for us all, these concepts included concepts of sense data, certain universals, and at certain points in his writings, a concept of oneself. So these are some of the things that Russell presents. And don't forget that the works of Russell, right, ties in well with the works of Carnap, right, who pushed the project of analysis to its limit. So Carnap argued that all concepts can be constructed from a single primitive concept along with logical concepts. And therefore, Carnap's primitive concept was a concept of the relation of phenomenal similarity. So the concept of phenomenal similarity is very, very important because similarity in some respect uh, refers to similarity between our experiences, right? 
roughly right, momentarily, that kind of thing. And of course, uh, being extracted at different times uh, of our lives. So in Canop's book, phenomenal always means experiential. So when he talks about phenomenal, right, experiences, when he talks about phenomenal, right, uh, concepts, then he is referring to experiential, and that is canap. So uh, it means experiential, uh, roughly pertaining to conscious experiences. Uh, for example, if a subject has two experiences, both involving a certain shade of red, the experiences will stand in this relation uh, in similarity. So, in other words, remember we are dealing with the concepts, right? Concepts are abstract, right? And they do describe the reality, right? But the concern of Canap and Russell and the rest was actually uh, conceptualizing, but this conceptualizing, uh, which is in terms of defining concepts. In fact, for some of you who are very familiar with the set theory, it's more or less what we do when we deal with the set theory. theory. You can say that let X, right, uh, be a set of mangoes, right, and then you start throwing mangoes there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Now all those are mangoes, but you can also say let S be a set of animals, then you can actually start throwing their dogs, cats, etc. They're all animals. But you can also say, let this be a set of fruits, right? Within there, you start throwing fruits there, right? And uh, you can have oranges, you can have mangoes, you can have passion fruits, etc. as long as they are fruits. So there we are trying to describe elements that constitute that particular aspect. And that's what actually Canap was concerned with. And uh, that is in the Canap's book of phenomenal. And phenomenal always means experiential, uh, roughly pertaining to conscious experiences. And uh, that's why we have that kind of thing. So when you say this is a bag that has red items, that's what, it, what, that's what it is. Now using this simple concept, Canap gave explicit constructions of many other concepts applying to experiences. So they were describing, right, experiences. For example, concepts of specific sensory qualities, uh, such as that of a certain shade of red, are defined in terms of chains or circle of similarity between experiences. Remember, I've already talked about the set theory. Do not forget, right? I know we can use so many words to describe these things, but at the end of the day, you'll get lost because you don't know what we are talking about. So in Canap's framework, these concepts are used to build up all of our concepts of the external world. So each one of us attempts to come up with that concept that describes the reality out there. So spatial and temporal concepts are, are defined in terms of sensory qualities. So that's why uh, behavior then is defined in terms of the motion of bodies, right? So we'll be talking about actions. For example, for example, mental states of other people are defined in terms of behavior. Cultural notions are defined in terms of these mental states and behavior and so on. So it must be acknowledged that the details are sometimes sketchy, but I'll tell you that if you go to the book of Canap's uh, uh, treatment of culture in chapter six, you'll find these things illustrated. So uh, from Canap's uh, work, as you can see, we can come up with a thesis that we call the definability thesis, right? Definability thesis. So when you start talking about definitions, you should know where we are coming from. And those various scholars that we thought that definability is important. So definability thesis, right, uh, simply tells us there is a compact class of primitive expressions such that all expressions are defined in terms of that class, right? 
We are dealing with a set theory, do not forget. Now, for most of the logical structure of the world, the class of primitive expressions included in, in an expression for phenomenal similarity, remember phenomenal according to Kana, simply means experiential, phenomenal similarity. And in numerous later works, such as the philosophy of logical atomism, right, atomism, then you are able to bring out that logical structure of these elements which are included in an expression for the phenomenon of similarity, ladies and gentlemen. So that's what it is. So let, in the logical structure uh, of the world, Carnap went on to argue that phenomenal similarity is itself dispensable. That's what he says. It can itself be defined in logical terms. Now, if so, then primitive expressions can be restricted to logical expressions. So logic then becomes very important. And I'm going to give you one aspect, and uh, I think I'll be closing this lecture. I think the most important thing for you to draw from this lecture is that we construct our world using some bit of logic, right? But uh, we start from the primitive concepts that describe the world, and then uh, we come uh, from there to another level where we have the phenomenon, which are ex uh, uh, experiential uh, realities out there. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if we draw uh, from the work of Carnap, uh, we can say that an expression E, let's take an example of E, expression E is definable in terms of uh, A, a class of expressions, C, right, if there is an adequate definition statement with the E on the left hand side and only expressions C on the right hand side. So we say that what exists on the right hand side is the same as what or explains or is explained but by what happens on the uh, right hand side. So that's why it is normal in the area of economics, right? For people to start coming up with these things uh, where they will say that Y, for instance, is a function of A, B, and C. And therefore, that kind of idea and thinking derives from uh, uh, Canap's uh, logical structure of the world. So whatever you have on the right-hand side must actually equate with what you have on the left hand side. So as an example, uh, uh, we can always get uh, these things and try to relate these things, right? So let's take an example, uh, a definition, or you can, we can take an example of definition statements for singular terms, right? And of course, general terms and the, predic and the predicates, predicates. Uh, which uh, might be required to specify the extension of the E, uh, which is expressed in terms of uh, those aspects that constitute E, right? So in such a definition, ladies and gentlemen, Hesperus is defined in terms of brightest, right? Or evening and so on. And Bachelor, let's take an example of Bachelor, Bachelor is defined in terms of unmarried, right? And probably man, and so on. And that's the example that I already stop at. Bachelor, definition for a bachelor. Remember, we are getting items on the right hand side and equating them to the items on the left hand side. Therefore, we define this as this. So, what you have on the right hand side equates to what you have on the left hand side. Like if you have simultaneous equations and you say y is equal to uh, 3x plus 5 and then you have another one, uh, y is equal to 8x squared plus 4 and then you're asked to find values that uh, uh, will uh, satisfy the two conditions in A and B and then you 
do these things, you, you, you solve the equation simultaneously, what we are saying at the end of this is that whatever value you get for x and y must satisfy all the equations, and whatever you have on the right hand side must equate what you have on the left hand side. So if we have a bachelor, uh, which, and the bachelor is defined in terms of unmarried, right? In other words, you have a concept, remember these are primitive concepts, unmarried, and the other concept is man, and so on. So therefore, we are bothered with the relationship between those two aspects, ladies and gentlemen. So let's just take this argument further, right? Because there are a number of things that must be put in place for that definition to be correct, right? So let's uh, take this argument to a higher level and say, suppose, uh, it happens that all bachelors uh, in the world are anti the men and vice versa. Remember, our original definition had things like unmarried and man. So therefore, bachelor will refer to the unmarried man. So those are two primitive concepts, right? Just like you will say, Hesperus is defined in terms of brightest and evening. So you have a brightest evening. And therefore, that is the definition. You can take another example, by the way, right? But supposing this bachelor that we defined as unmarried and man has other things attached to that. And it is possible, by the way, to have other things attached. So let's suppose that um, all bachelors in our world are anti the men and vice versa. So it means that for you to come up with a definition that is uh, encompassing, you say for all X, right? X is a bachelor if and only if X is an, an untidy man is true. And the definition statement is extensionally adequate. Remember that's an extension now. But still, this statement does not seem to give an adequate definition of a bachelor. So to handle these cases, it is common to require some form of stronger than extensional, or what we call intentional, adequate, right? Or adequacy, intentional adequacy for a definition. For example, it is often required that a definition statement uh, be analytic, if it is analytic, it is true in a virtue of meaning. That very definition statement should be a priori. So it must have those three things. Analytic, true in a virtue of meaning. Two, a priori, knowable without justification from experience. And three, necessary, true in all possible worlds. So a definition of bachelor in terms of anti-demand does not meet these conditions. So therefore, all bachelors are anti-demand is not true in virtue of meaning. And one cannot know a priori that all bachelors are anti-demand. So it, that only happens after you've gone there and you have discovered that that is what's happening. And it is not true in all possible worlds that all bachelors are anti the men. But at least we know very well, and we can argue that a definition of bachelor in terms of unmarried man meets these conditions. Therefore, you must know these things, and uh, you must always be uh, concerned about the conceptualization uh, so that uh, we do uh, understand the logical structure of the world as put forth by uh, Canap uh, in his works. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if we go back to that very example, uh, while a definition of bachelor as unmarried man may shed some light on the meaning of bachelor and how we come to know truth about bachelors, the same does not seem to be true of a definition of anti man even if definition is extensional, extensionally adequate. And therefore, uh, we need to get to that element of analyticity 
uh, prioritisty and necessity, right? And that is really a very strong uh, criteria that uh, ensures that an expression and its definition are connected, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so as to get the actual meaning of those things. So that's why we go into semantics, right? We go into epistemology, we go into modale, and modale refers to the realm of necessity and possibility, ladies and gentlemen. So having said that, uh, that brings us to uh, the end of definability concept that we've just come up with. But since initially we looked at uh, Laplace's scrutability theory, so this brings us to this extension that we call the, defi the definitional scrutability, definitional scrutability, right? And the definitional scrutability simply tells us that there is a compact class of truth from which all truths are definitionally scrutable. Scrutable becomes an important element here, ladies and gentlemen. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that has brought us to the end of this lecture. And uh, in this lecture, I hope you know what our concerns were. Uh, since in the last lecture, we looked at uh, the concept of knowledge, uh, but more so the uh, understanding the realities out there. We looked at the construction of the world. Uh, in this lecture, we are discussing the scrutability concept that we covered and the logical structure of the world constituted by concepts. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for attending. In our next lecture, uh, which will be lecture five, we shall attempt to go into uh, some of the concepts in economics and then try to bring out the philosophies of those concepts. Uh, thank you very much for attending this lecture. Uh, I wish you the best of time. Uh, stay well and stay safe. Bye.